We're getting ready to start the review session, the agenda review session. We have ordinance on second reading, an ordinance, a resolution to amend the ordinance, ordinance 012301 on second reading. Ordinances on first reading, an ordinance to amend or supplement the revised general ordinance of the city of New Brunswick. This is related to add a, sex, add a new section, 3.28.045, purchase of manhole cover schemes. Number two, an ordinance to amend and supplement the revised general ordinances of the city of New Brunswick, Title 10, Vehicles and Traffic. This is in reference to Livingston Avenue. We have resolutions 1 to 57. Number 1, approve agenda amendments. 2, approve payroll. 3, authorize refund for redeem tax sales certificates. Number 4, approve a work con on contract with Edmonds GovTech. Number 5, authorize professional service agreement with Phoenix Advisors, LLC. Number 6, authorize professional service agreement with Samuel Klein and Company. 7, Approve amendment of resolution R122168, and this is with NSYNC Municipal System doing business as First Bite Corporation. Number eight, authorized professional service agreement. This is with Charlie Gaden for Assistant City Attorney. Number nine, authorized professional service agreement with Hatfield Schwartz Law Group. Number 10, authorized professional service agreement with French and Perello Associates. 11, release of site performance guarantee. This is in reference to College Avenue Redevelopment Redevelopment Associates. Number 12, approve a payment for emergency procurement. This is for public works for replacement of a sewage grinder. 13, advice and consent to mayoral appointments of department heads, various department heads. Number 14, award of professional service agreement with two Delaware Brighton engineers. 15, award professional service agreement with two big nail planning consultants. 16, award professional services to Mike Manuel, Scotland, and Bowman. 17, approve an amendment of resolution 012263. This is um, in reference to 2023 municipal payroll services. Number 18, approve amendment of resolution R082277. This is the new date, relaxation of the city noise ordinance. Number 18, approve amendment of resolution 012234. New date, approve relaxation of city noise ordinance. Number 20, approve amendment of resolution R102249. The reason is new date, and this is related to the relaxation of city noise ordinance and road closures. 21, approve amendment of resolution 032229. The reason is for new dates, approve relaxation of city noise ordinance. 22, authorize professional service agreement with Hogan, Logan, Moran, Dogs, and Ducas. This is um, 2023 special counsel for tax appeals. 23, authorize professional service agreement with special data logic. 24, authorized professional service agreement with De Francesco Bateman PC. 25, authorized professional service agreement with BRB Evaluation and Consulting Services. 26, authorized professional service agreement with Civil Solution. Number 27, authorized professional service agreement with BRT Technologies. 28, approval of water contracts. This is with Estabuas Asphalt Company and Trap Rock Industries. Number 29, authorized professional service agreement with McManimon, Scotland and Bauman. 30th, authorized award of professional service agreement with Ortho Thibault. Let's go. And this is for a special counsel. 31, approved professional service agreement with Power DMS. Again. 32, approval amendment of resolution R012245. This is to pay invoice in the amount of 3,426.02. 33, authorize lease of copy machine for the police department. 34, approve a work contact with gold type business machine doing business as GTBM. 35, authorize professional service agreement with InSync Municipal System 
doing business as First Bite Corporation. 36, authorized professional service agreement with Bridgewater Veterinary Hospital. <coughs> 37, authorized professional service agreement with Mac McDonald Group. 38, approval award of contract with Roberts Engineering Group, LLC. 39, authorized award of professional service agreement with Eurofins Environment Testing. 40, authorized approval of agreement with Panella Guild, Varela Guild. 41, authorized extension of contract with Wellness Coaches USA. 42, approve amendment of resolution 12277. This is to extend the contract for one additional year. 43, amendment of, approve amendment of resolution R12223. The reason is to add an additional amount of 9,642. 44, authorized professional service agreement with Robert Johnson Physician Enterprise, PA. 45, approval and award of contract with Clean Air Company. 46, approval amendment of resolution R012278 to extend the contract for an additional six months. 47, approval and award of contract to with maximum quality foods. 48, approve award professional service agreement to Mark McDonald Group, doing business at Mark McDonald LLC. 49, approval amendment of resolution 122272. The reason is to correct the date. Mm -hmm. Number 50, authorize, authorization to accept grant from the county of Middlesex for Cold Blue Warming Center. The amount is $90,000. 51, approval resolution to refer the New Brunswick Downtown Redevelopment Plan to the Planning Board for review and report. 52 authorized reimbursement to multifamily property owners for trash and recyclables for the year 2022. 53 approval of work of contract with Bright New Engineering. 54 advice and consent to rent control board, reappointments and appointment. 55 approved person to person transfer to legal license. This is from Shoka LLC, trading as Gambinos Inc. to Gloria Vasquez, trading as Tequila House. 56, approve amendment of resolution R082106. It's a change order with dual building restoration. And 57, approve resolution to refer an amendment of the zoning ordinance to the planning board for review and report. Then we will have um, discussions, either discussion by the council, public comment, and the next council meeting reminder. At this time, Madam Clerk, can you call the meeting to order? Council Member Anderson? Here. Council Member Castaneda? Here. Council Member Fleming? Here. Council Member Gaskin? Here. Council Member Sikora Ludwig? Here. Council Vice President Egan? Here. Council President Escobar? Here. Please be advised that the notice requirements of the Open Public Meeting Act has been complied with and satisfied in that the annual notice which gave sufficient notice of the time and place and conduct of all public meetings of the Municipal Council of the City of New Brunswick has been filed with the City Clerk, has been placed on an appropriate bulletin board, and posted in the back vestibule of City Hall visible to the public through the windows in the lobby of City Hall, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and has been transmitted to the official newspaper for the City of New Brunswick, namely the Home News Tribune. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in a moment to remember, uh, we just have the Martin Luther King Day on Monday, just to remember our duty to serve and that we continue to, our, this legacy, to continue seeking Justice, equality for all. Thank you. Motion to accept the minute. Second. Council Member Anderson? Yes. Council Member Castaneda? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Gaskin? Yes. Council Member Sikora Ludler? Yes. Council Vice President Egan? Yes. Council President Escobar? Yes. 
Madam Claire, has the correspondence been directed to the appropriate departments? Yes, Madam President, the correspondence received by the city clerk's office was forwarded to the appropriate departments for further action. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to have, uh, we're going to start with the ordinance. We have an ordinance on second reading. This is um, a resolution to amend ordinance 0012301 on second reading, which is an ordinance to amend and supplement the revised general ordinances of the city of New Brunswick, Title 17, Zoning, Chapter 17.02, Definitions, and Chapter 17.04, related to Zoning districts. Before we go into this um, resolution to public comment on the resolution only, um, can I have Mr. Dominguez, if you could just give um, an explanation to this. Um, thank you, Council President. Um, so uh, after the planning board meeting last week, uh, we kind of thought through the ordinance a little bit and we felt that it was important to, given the feedback we got at the planning board meeting, to adjust the definitions to be less ambiguous and clearer. Uh, so the city put together a more, uh, I don't want to say accurate, but a better set of definitions for the uses in question. Uh, and should the council act favorably, this would uh, essentially be a new first reading and re-referral -re back to the planning board uh, for a, a date in the future to be held for a, a second reading and adoption, should, should the council act favorably. Thank you. At this time, we're going to ask for the public um, uh, comment on the amendment only. We are not here to talk about the ordinance at this time. So if you have any comments on the amendment of the ordinance, please come up to the mic, state your name and address, and only on the amendment. Have you none? Move the oh. resolution, sure. Daniel. Are you coming, Daniel? Miss Daniel? Yes, I will. I just want to make sure when you said this was at the planning board. Hi, uh, yes, Daniel Moore, Somerset Street. Street. Is uh, Mr. Dominguez talking about uh, what just went through at the planning board meeting re recently? Um, or is this something di different? I didn't hear the category. If I may. So this was at the planning board, but it wasn't the application before the planning board has nothing to do with uh, the Sears application. This has to do with the zoning amendment that was on for that same meeting. I don't know if you stuck around for that. Or not. Yes, we yeah. it was two of them. One was involved with trucking, dealing yes, with trucking. Yes, that, that's an amendment to that. That's, that's the one. Oh, oh, okay, so like I said, I was just wondering which one it was. I know it was two things that was held. And I will say thank, that thank you, Mr. Dominguez, and the planning board, which I did say, it's about time that, wow, you really looked at what was the side effects, what was going to hurt the other people's businesses. And I thank you for looking into it, because like I said, that's what needs to be more done, plenty more, due to where looking at side effects, due to where you're busy just doing one thing, oh, thinking you're going to help some, something one way, and you hurt another way. And like I said, after the owners and all spoke up, like I said, I thank the planning board and you, Mr. Dominguez, for making your mind up, for making sure it wouldn't hurt the other business owners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anybody else on the amendment? Only just on the amendment. We're not talking about the ordinance at this point. Thank you, yes. Council President, members of the Council. My name is uh, Tom Trapper. I'm an attorney from the law firm of Chiesa, Shahani, and, and Gia Tomasi. I represent 107 Howe Lane Realty LLC and Meat Lot uh, Leasing LLC. They are the respective property owners of 107 Howe Lane and 113 Howe Lane. I just wanted to come up and uh, express support for the a notion that the ordinance would be referred back to the planning board for further consideration and comment regarding the definitions and some other elements of the ordinance and we would look forward to the opportunity to working with the uh, city's professionals as well as the planning board in this council uh, regarding uh, uh, potential tweaks to the ordinance but uh, with that uh, just wanted to express support for the re-referral back to the planning board. Anybody else? Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Fr Franz Kishasman. I am the owner of 107 Helen property and I have a few comments to make. We believe this proposed amendment impacts the industrial zone of New Brunswick negatively. It reduces the potential land value which impacts the tax base. The value of my property which has been a trucking facility for over 60 years 
is likely to be half of the value under the new ordinance. It's not just my property, but other properties in the I-2 industrial zone as well. This impact on property values directly impacts the tax base of the city of New Brunswick and the property tax values equal higher tax revenues for the city. For example, the property of similar value to ours at 1007 Jersey Avenue pays $355,429 annually in property taxes. Before redevelopment, the property was paid $88,000. And their property is quite similar to mine in size. In fact, as a matter of fact, it's smaller, but the building is larger in size. Um, it, that, is, that constitutes a four-time increase in taxes due to redevelopment. In addition to this ordinance, places additional burden on industrial businesses. It includes such provisions as the inclusion of solar panels, renewable energy requirements, which are costly, as well as 24-hour security service. These requirements have not been applied to other developments in New Brunswick, namely the redevelopment of the 30-acre Sears site, which has no such requirement, no solar panels, no electric charging stations for electric vehicles but will have significant vehicular traffic, residential car parking at close to 300 parking spots, as well as daily delivery vehicles, such as Uber pickups, etc. There is no 24-hour security requirement placed on that residential site, nor any other industrial sites here in the city of New Brunswick. Lastly, the wind system and solar panel farms are also contained within the ordinance are frivolous, in that the land value in this area is too high to support such endeavors. Most importantly, the industrial area is impacted by this ordinance and cannot be redeveloped into affordable housing or medical centers or schools due to New Jersey environmental constraints. We know this is a hot topic within the community, but it is simply not a legal option due to the environmental issues within the zone that the state of New Jersey is aware and prohibits. This zone is a CEA classified exemption area for chlorinated chemicals and vapor intrusion. The industrial area of New Brunswick has long been an area of trucking. It is within minutes of major highways. Trucks are necessary to provide jobs and provide people with the goods they require, groceries, medicines, Amazon deliveries, and the like. All these goods are moved by trucks, and the area is well suited to this, to this and truck terminal and drainage. We would like to request a meeting with the council to further discuss this ordinance, the definition and the impact on the impact and on the impact on the property value. Thank you. This is um, this is just on the amendment at this point that we are uh, there will be it will come back to us and you have an opportunity at February uh, second the second meeting in February to further discuss the ordinance. At this point. Once that planning. goes to the planning, yeah, we're planning to have it here to come there too. Well, so they can go to the planning, yeah. absolutely. So at this point, can I have a motion? Uh, motion? Oh, okay. Uh, 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 you just have to please come up and tell right. Just remember that this is not on the resolution, it's just on the amendment only okay. for us to repair it back. It's okay. I, I, I just have to say it. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I, I, I changed. I was scribbling. Oh. I gotta put my readers on. Excuse me. It, it's, it's quick. Oh, uh, good evening, good people of New Brunswick. I'm uh, here in regards to the ordinance of uh, Title 17. This, these changes really don't affect me today and may not affect me ever. However, I'm here to support one of my neighbors. To let you know, I prevent, I've presented in front of uh, the CPSC, worked indirectly with the California Energy Commission, the National Electric Code. I've chaired an ANSI committee and on an and currently on an ANSI review committee and also on an ANSI writing committee. Um, words and thoughts that have come out of my head are currently laws in states all across our nation. Um, I attended the council meeting in December concerning this matter. I attended the following meeting concerning this matter in January. And with today's revisions, I'm even more distraught than I was before I went into the building. 
Um, the new definitions for fulfillment center, parcel distribution center, uh, I have a problem with. I asked at the meeting uh, where the requirement for 70% solar came from and told it was uh, indirectly to add a cost to discourage people from coming to New Brunswick and building a terminal in New Brunswick. The correct answer to that question would have been, hey, it's here to, to uh, charge the uh, futuristic electric trucks. In my opinion, that's just bad writing. And all numbers, when you put them into council notes, law, and whatnot, either need to be justified with facts or science. I asked about an alternative about having a white roof to uh, lessen the heat island effect that could be in New Brunswick, which would also lessen the effect of uh, heating and cooling the building, which would also indirectly save electricity, but received uh, no answer as an acceptable option. I asked about the possibility of using CNG trucks, biodiesel trucks, technology that's not even there. Maybe the Tesla guy will come up with something new. Who knows? But the way it's written, it's not enforceable and it's a farce. And when I pushed on that subject, I was told, well, we have eight years to change, and maybe in the future, everything will be electric and we can change, put a variance in in eight years. But that's the wrong answer. That's not the way you write code. That's not the, right, the way you write an ordinance. You leave the ordinance open for revision and for new technology instead of pigeonholing yourself into poor writing and worrying about changing it eight years from now. I don't know if I'm going to be here in eight years to fix this mess. I don't know if you're going to be there in eight years to fix the mess. But you don't start with a mess. I've seen bad building code be put forth and turn into law. And when it's not checked by people in your position or people who are smarter than me, it takes years of, and years to correct an inaccuracy like this. The problem is once one town puts bad writing into an ordinance, the other towns will copy it, figuring the city of New Brunswick is smart. They did research. They did their due diligence. They can back up all their numbers. However, that's not the case with the ordinance in front of me. I went to school right down the street on Lincoln F. And would have been told by my teachers to start all over because my piece of paper would have been bleeding red with all their corrections. If New Brunswick really wants to be the hub city, how can it dissuade people from having a trucking terminal, which, is a, which was there before, a fulfillment center, which I really don't have a problem with, and a parcel distribution center? And if I was in your position, I'd be ashamed of accepting the, the uh, new ordinance the way it is written. I heard the following from the people sitting on your side of the desk. Um, we don't want, you don't want a truck terminal in New Brunswick. Um, you don't want containers stacked to the sky and look like Elizabeth. I can understand that. However, if you don't want a shipping container yard, just write that. If you don't want a drop and pull truck yard, just write that. This is just incorrect. And, and here's my point, which I learned from some people who are no longer around, most of my mentors. When you write code, laws, ordinance, amendments, and etc., write what you mean and mean what you write. You should be short, concise, without room for interpretation. For, for example, the Ten Commandments, they do a good job on that. Thank you, sir. Okay, in, oh, I got two, two, three lines left. In conclusion, what you proposed is not justified, not enforceable, and doesn't rely on a proven science. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Like I, I said before, you will have an opportunity in the public again at the planning board and again at this council to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, to express your concerns in favor or concerns with this ordinance. At this time, I will entertain a motion to move the amendment to the resolution. So move this. Yes. Uh, to the ordinance, I'm sorry. The resolution to amend the ordinance. Second. Roll call. Council Member Anderson? Yes. Council Member Castaneda? Yes. Mm. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Gaskin? Yes. Council Member Sikor Ludwig? Yes. Council Vice President Egan? Yes. Council President Escobar. Yes. Now at this time, I would like to entertain a motion to move this um, 
ordinance as to, amended as amended to second reading to the second reading for the next um council meeting set for february 15th. that's not the next one it's the one. second I mean, meeting. the second meeting i was yeah the february 15th meeting at, at 5 30. 30. please so thank moved. you second roll call council member anderson yes council member castaneda yes council member fleming yes council member gaskins yes Council Member Socorro Ludwig. Yes. Council Vice President Egan. Yes. Council President Escobar. Yes. At this time, we have one ordinance. On, uh, the first one in the first reading is an ordinance to amend and supplement the revised general ordinances of the City of New Brunswick, Title III, Revenue and Finance, Chapter 3.28, Fee Schedule. This is to add a new section, 3.28.045, Purchase of Manual Cover Fees. Move, move the ordinance setting down February 1st, 2023, same day to be advertised. Second. Council Member Anderson? Yes. Council Member Castaneda? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Gaskin? Yes. Council Member Sapor Ludwig? Yes. Council Vice President Egan? Yes. Council President Escobar? Yes. <laughs> At this time, we have an ordinance to amend and supplement the revised general ordinances of the City of New Brunswick, Title 10, Vehicles and Traffic, Chapter 10.16, Stopping, Standing or Parking, Section 10.16.210, Schedule 38, Time Limit, Parking Areas, Wilson Avenue. Move the ordinance setting down February 1st, 2023, same date to be advertised. Second. Council Member Anderson? Yes. Council Member Castaneda? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Gaskin? Yes. Council Member Sapor Ludwig? Yes. Council Vice President Egan? Yes. Council President Escobar? Yes. Before we go into resolutions, I uh, want to open the floor for any of my colleagues, council members. Do you have any questions on any of the resolutions? So, any comments from resolutions 1 to 57? Uh, most of the resolutions before us tonight are yearly business, including professional service agreements and contracts. I'd like to comment on 13. Each of these appointees has done a tremendous job working with the city and moving it forward, and I believe they uh, will continue to do a good job in a very professional manner. 14 through 16, these companies have been vetted by the planning board, and based on our experience with them, found them to be appropriate for these services moving forward. 18 through 21, I thought it was a very good idea to, the, to do the relaxation of the noise ordinance for the whole year instead of coming back on a monthly basis, considering these are all um, large projects. 40 is an exciting project with the proposed sculpture of Paul Robeson. And 51 is the last one I want to comment on. That's the referral of the redevelopment plan for downtown to the planning board. The current plan has been in place for about 45 years over such time, creating sub-areas and inconsistencies with zoning. The new plan utilizes zoning recommendations in the 2022 master plan. It adds, among other recommendations, density and height bonuses um, for prospective affordable housing clients, as well as reduced parking requirements and sky exposure relaxation. It encourages smart planning, high density and commercial use, plus it is in proximity to um, transportation downtown, so it creates environmental benefits in relation to what we want to do. The details of this plan will be um, forthcoming at the planning board. Those are all my comments. Thank you. Anybody else? Before we go into the resolutions? Okay. So at this time, we are preparing to open the meeting for public comments on the resolutions only. You have up to five minutes and time off. Any members of the public wishes to speak to the council on any of the resolutions, please approach the mic. Good evening, Council President, members of the Council. I'm Charlie Cranville from New Brunswick, editor of New Brunswick Today, and uh, do want to voice my support for finally getting a statue of Paul Robeson here in New Brunswick. I think he's an honorable man, and it'll be a good thing for future generations to be able to remember him and his contributions, not only to New Brunswick, but to our society. Uh, I'm curious about the Code Blue grant. I believe it's uh, number 50. 
$90,000. Could somebody just explain how it works? Is it something where the county gives us, the city, the money, and then the city spends it appropriately? Or is it something where the city spends money and then applies for reimbursement after it spent the money? The rest of our knowledge is that close reimbursement. Reimbursement. Okay. And I'll note that the grant that's on tonight's agenda is for the 2022 slash 23 season, which obviously already began in November. Code Blue has been in operation on, on many nights so far. Um, do we have any idea how much uh, how many how much cost the city's already incurred so far that you will be applying for reimbursement for at this time? We usually uh, we have for 2022 up to now. Yeah, for this this grant. I don't have those numbers. I don't even have that figure with us tonight. No, we, we have uh, for 2022, 2023, we have put together a budget, and depending on the amount of code blue events, uh, we'll determine what close we come into that budget and all the costs associated. Okay, and is this the second or third grant that the city's gotten of this amount? I recall this first happened in 2021. So is this, this the second 90,000? Yeah. Okay, and just to be clear, there's a requirement in accepting the money that the city will open up the Code Blue warming center any night that the county calls it Code Blue. So, it, it, the, the 90, right now, yes. And right now, we're talking about the $90,000 you know, accepting it. So, yes. Right, so by. If you have anything to say other than the $90,000, we can talk about it in the public policy. Right. And so, by, by accepting it, the city's agreeing to open the shelter anytime the temperature is predicted to be 32 or lower, and, and the county makes the call. But when the county makes the call, the city's on the hook to do it, right? Okay, so I am concerned because there have been at least three nights so far this season where the, sh the warming center has not opened. And I know I, I, I communicated with you, mm -hmm. Council President, I don't know if you were able to get to the bottom of it, but um, I do have a document I'd like to share with the members of the council. Yes, at this point, we just, Stick with the resolution. Anything other than that, we will talk about it in public comment, and there will be a follow-up with some of the questions that you might or might not have. So right now, we're just doing the resolution at ninety thousand dollars to accept that in the county. Right, and so we've established that that ninety thousand dollar grant comes with a commitment. In the resolution, the city of New Brunswick commits to open a warming center when code blue is called by the Middlesex County Office of Emergency Management. Friday night, it was 32 degrees, and the warming center did not open. You can see in the email that I'm sharing with you from the county communications person, quote, I looked into this, and unfortunately, there was a typo in the email address used to notify New Brunswick on Friday regarding the code blue. The issue has been raised and has been rectified. So what that tells me is there's a really sloppy system in place for determining when New Brunswick opens the warming center or not. There was no... Uh, there's no piece where New Brunswick says, okay, we'll do it, and, and then it gets uh, confirmed by the county. We, we, we missed a code blue because of a typo in, I guess, on the county's end. But nobody here was, you know, checking or communicating with the county to see if they called it or not. I, I, don't, I don't get it how one email type of grant. You're violating the grant if you're not if you're not following up your commitment, Councilman. Again, um, Mr. Carnival, we would address that. Um, I will address that later on. Right now, we speak to the resolution, and it is just to accept the grant from the county for nine thousand dollars. Right, and I hope this city will honor the commitment that it's taking on hey. by hey. accepting the grant. It's a good thing that the county's chipping in. Now it's on the city to follow through. And um, uh, I hope you take my concern seriously. Uh, you know, I, I know I reached out to you Friday when I saw that there was no code blue in place, and unfortunately, actions that could have been taken were not taken. So I'll leave it at that. I do want to also ask about the downtown redevelopment plan. Um, what what specific sites are going to be affected? Yeah, I'm sorry. You're not. You, you won't answer the question. Time is up. I just, I got the question in before the end. Excuse me. Treat people yep. that well. We don't need any lawyers in the back. We have enough of those. We got enough lawyers. I'm, I'm, I'm the one in charge of the meeting. Mm -hmm. 
already said that you time yourself, Mr. Cladwell. Thank you. Okay. You could bring I'll see you soon. Thank you. Hi, yes, Danielle Moore of Somerset Street. I'm also going to speak on the $90,000 due to I just seen an article with Code Blue is no longer accepting uh, volunteers to do Code Blue that you're hiring for workers. Would you please tell me what is the income, any type of income in paying people going to come out of this $90,000? Again, um, Ms. Danielle. <coughs> Later on, at the public portion before. No, that's not public. I, 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 I asked you about the $90,000. The $90,000 we are to run the whole group. So please, and I'm going to have, can you answer my question? I will answer the work that you want to do. Listen to me for a second. That's what I'm asking you. Well, I assure you, I assure you that I'm going to answer that question. There was, you know, I, 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 before the public portion of the meeting, there's all the things that I'm going to address regarding code blue because of the last meeting that we had. Well, and that might include. I say you should so, address first due to so where I, people do to it. After you address, we don't get a chance to come back up and comment on No, things. you're going to so have I a chance. You, you you're going to have a chance. Believe me, you're going to have a chance because I'm going to make so, so another thing, with this $90,000, please tell me, will this time, will it start getting cleaned in there, the sheets, where, where even though you don't have to have the volunteers, but please tell me, I will say thank you, God bless that you did go over there and investigate, because I say it has been better, but please tell me, will the proper things from sanitation getting cleaned and everything be done properly due to where you're getting $90,000? Yes. I can assure you, yes. Honestly, I trust you due to where you were the only one that looked into the first time. And like I said, I'm just very disappointed where, wow, you had city employees who volunteer over there and didn't mention a anything about how nasty it was for Code Blue. Well, I assure you that. I do trust you on that. And the other one that I would like to speak on, that's for us with the. I saw something with the contract ending with the 911. Please tell me, I hope you did not renew a contract with Rucker in regards to 911 emergency 32 with communications where for how long have I been telling you, wow, 911 745-5200 needs to go back to New Brunswick Police Headquarters. Wow, is it going to take one of you to see an incident where it takes 25 minutes to 30 minutes for a police car or ambulance to come your, your, your way for you to understand? I've proven to you plenty of times, so please tell me you didn't renew a contract yes, with, with this Rutgers. This resolution that you're talking about, that you're referring to, is to pay the bill for November and oh, December. Okay, but it has so nothing to do with contract. It's just to pay any so bills. We owe that money. That's all we That's so all so we please tell me if you're so, so, so due to where this says up until December 2022, okay, okay. this is 20. So, 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 okay, will you be pay, still continue paying? Did you renew the contract yes, with so Rutgers? Resolutions, we cannot answer that at this point. Like mm -hmm. I said, sad to say, well, I think about how, how long it's going to take for an emergency for Rufford Village. And like I said, due to where what? Come on, I lost a neighbor with communication with 911 and 745 5200. Due to where going the wrong location, due, due to where, come on, too much is happening. I'm not the only one seeing this. Wow, you're on Facebook, you see the articles. Oh, well, you have to wave down, Mr. In, uh, we're a couple of the firefighters to, to help people. Come on, do due to where what with all this building that you're doing one thing please think of wow more people we're going to need more rescue rescue ambulance and like i said you're doing this but like i said wow i appreciate you coming please send me over at this point we're just talking about paying an invoice well, well please and Thank like you. i said i hope you just take it seriously and wow one of you don't have to really see how long it takes <clears throat> what you get involved in something waiting 25 minutes to 30 minutes for ambulance or a police car because I'm surely not happy, and it's not like I have improved, and other residents have improved themselves as well. Thank you, Thank you. Anybody else on the resolutions only? Have you know? Any new resolutions? Second. Roll call. Council Member Anderson? Yes. Council Member Castaneda? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Gaskins? Yes. Council Member Sikora Ludwig? Yes. Council Vice President Egan? Yes. Council President Escobar. Yes. At this time, before we go into the public um, comment portion of the meeting, um, does any of my fellow council members would like to address um, the public? Go ahead. Thank you. 
Councilman Anderson. Uh, I'd like to give my condolences to the Keefe family on the passing of Mr. Ed Keefe. Mr. Keefe is a New Brunswick person through and through. Uh, he sat on a few boards and everything, so we'd like to send our condolences to him, uh, his family, and all his friends. Anybody else from the council? Which is too okay. um, just before we go into the uh, public portion, having the, the members come up, I uh, just there's a few things that um, we have to give an update from the last meeting that we had here. At the last meeting, there was a few allegations made against um, the Cold Blue program. Uh, I asked the business administrator to investigate some of those allegations. Uh, I just want to make clear that it's not the intention of this council to run the day-to-day -day operations of the program of the Cold Blue program. I think that. My intention, at least, is to ensure that we are complying, we are working in accordance with the legislation, that we have the safety of the staff and the guests uh, as a priority, and also that we provide a temporary warming, which is that's what we're supposed to uh, give a warming place shelter when the temperatures go below 32 that are optimal, right? That they have the, uh, that we have what is needed and that they have optimal sanitary conditions. Uh, it's not to run the day to day operations. So in, in such, uh, Mr. Drulis, can you please give a, an update, a summary of the investigation, uh, give us a report on the investigation that, based on the allegations made to this council. Certainly. <clears throat> At the request of the Council President, I'm providing the following information regarding Code Blue, particularly on the volunteers, reimbursements, and facilities. Regarding volunteers, prior to the pandemic and prior to the city transitioning to the lead organization for Code Blue, uh, just a little information about volunteers. Volunteers need to be 18 years old, need to be able to get to the site and work a full shift. Um, this is important because the process involved candidates making their interests known by completing an online Google survey sent out and managed by the head of Code Blue. If a volunteer was needed and there was a qualified candidate, then the candidate would be contacted by phone for an interview and vetted uh, with a reference check. This was done by the head of Code Blue. From that point forward, the communication was between the head of Code Blue and the volunteer in the assignment of the volunteers accordingly. Candidates who apply to the Code Blue program to volunteer are not truly volunteers or were not truly volunteers until they've gone through this process. Unless a candidate is specifically contacted by the head of Code Blue to become a volunteer and participate, they're still just a candidate and not permitted to volunteer. This is for the safety of Code Blue participants, staff, and the candidate. Prior to the pandemic, the city was simply hosting a space and providing the community minimal administrative support. Um, its exposure and liability was, was minimal. Now, as the lead agency for the program, the city's liability exposure has grown significantly. As much as the city would like the help of volunteers, we've been advised that only city employees are properly insured to administer this program. Excuse me. Excuse me. If you keep this outburst, I'm going to ask you to step out. So let's try to con Excuse me. Again, I ask you respectfully to stay quiet, and if you're not able to do so, I respectfully ask you to come out of the meeting. Thank you. I'll, I'll restate that statement. As much as the city would like the help of volunteers, we have been advised that only city employees are properly insured to administer this program, and the city can no longer assume the liability of non-city employee volunteers. Therefore, the city no longer utilizes volunteers for Code Blue. Regarding purchases and reimbursements, as you know, the Code Blue operation runs opposite regular city hours and on weekends. There have been times when the head of Code Blue was informed that the Code Blue site ran out of supplies, like garbage bags and other items. In these off hours, the best solution was to purchase these items and bring them to the Code Blue site as they were needed. These are items that the Code Blue director could get reimbursed and still has the ability to be reimbursed for. As it relates to facilities and procedures, at the close of each Code Blue, the city's public property division arrives on site. They work with the Code Blue staff to clean up the space and return it to its regular use. 
Any replenishment of supplies, vandalism, or required repairs are reported to administration for action. Thank you, Council President. Thank you so much. So like I said, I think that um, I hope this clear out some of the uh, assumptions that were made. Uh, as I said in the past, you know, I went, uh, so I witnessed, you know, that some things needed to be uh, taken attention to. Uh, they have pay attention to it. I am 100% confident that with the staff, I think it's a good idea that we have staff there now. We don't have to worry about whether we have enough volunteers or we don't have volunteers. I think um, if the operations of the warming shelter would be much better. And, um, and I'm confident that all the staff and everybody who's involved in Conglue and Operate Conglue are doing the best um, for those who are, I guess, doing that. Uh, nonetheless, I will continue to be uh, looking into the, the Conglue to make sure that we keep operating the way we are uh, supposed to. And I hope that uh, that clears away any misunderstanding. The other question, is, uh, Mr. Barron, you might have it. On Friday, uh, the uh, situation that Mr. Cradle alluded to, uh, there was a, a typo, I guess. So do you have any more information on that, on that Friday, of what happened? Mr. President, I don't have any additional information. You have some, Mr. Jones? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Friday, we did not receive a cold blue text, a uh, cold blue email from the county. The temperature didn't dip below the threshold until about 5 in the morning for us, so we didn't think anything of it because at that point, it's the next morning. I figured that they made a judgment call at the county, therefore, they didn't call it on that Friday. Saturday, I didn't receive an email as well, so I'm like, okay, what's going on? So, I call John Ferguson after a text and say, hey, are we calling Code Blue for tonight? He said, yes, we called it for Friday for the next four days. I said, well, I didn't get an email for Friday. He chalked it up to maybe it's in my spam or anything like that. I get a call from the county two days ago saying, hey, uh, Mr. Craddleville is calling, asking why you didn't open for Code Blue. I said, I never got an email. So they checked their logs to see if they had an email. Uh, and of course, they had a typo in the email, so it never made it to me. But I called it for Saturday all the way through Monday. So the email for Friday was for four days. Never got the email, but I still called it for Saturday through Monday because that temperature was definitely going to be cold blue. Friday was still on the cusp. That's the only reason why red flag wasn't raised. Thank you. Um, so anybody else from the board council would like to make a comment? Are we done? So now the members of the public view may come and step up to the microphone. You have up to five minutes to make a comment. And um, please state your name and address when you come up. It's only one time only. One time? Yes. Why? Los Angeles. That's a little, okay. All right. Um, so I don't feel like I have to give my address or my name. That's pretty ridiculous. That's really obvious to houses folks who don't even have an address or undocumented folks who, you know, are worried about retaliation. I'll give you Luke. So, how are we supposed to know where this 90K is going to and what it's going to be spent on? Last time, folks expressed how Chief Keith Jones decided to clo close Code Blue to volunteers, citing ulterior motives, and for that, what could that be? Better living conditions for people just like you and I? As such, I was not able to volunteer alongside others until this week when I attended a roaming shelter held in one of the churches. Although I never experienced Code Blue, I am for certain that the city views houseless people with contempt. Everyone here had their personal cots with belongings allowed to be kept during the day. Sheets and whatnot were cleaned and Code Blue, they reeked of piss and had dry blood on them. A woman who cooked dinner expressed in passing that she didn't have health insurance. The coordinators bought the food for folks with their own money. The cook was still there to serve her neighbors, unlike you city administrators who leech off state benefits while producing no labor and value whatsoever. Also, no food is served at Code Blue. Lights were turned off at 10 and folks were allowed to leave in and out for fresh air, private conversations, private time, and smoke breaks. Lights are on all night at Code Blue and once you step in that door, you're not allowed if you want to stay the full night. Users were given a biohazard container in the restroom and no one was criticized, let alone asked intensively or policed about possible usage. When one shelter seeker was experiencing a disassociative episode, 
Volunteers worked with them to make them feel safe and comfortable. A few folks came late due to working beforehand. At Code Blue, they would have been turned down and kept out because they did not make it in time. However, irregardless of whether one works or not, all of these people deserve to be treated humanely, and one thing, they need one thing desperately, housing. Yet this city continues to harass, harass its houseless, tearing down tents and crafting Code Blue into a setting that resembles a prison. How is a program that treats people like convicts going to promote this supposed safety that you preach about, whether it be to visit volunteers or shelter seekers? Not once did I feel unsafe in the church's shelter. Some of my volunteers slept in, a, in, a, in an outside room with the door unlocked, and they did not feel unsafe either. Is there even any proof of the toilet being vandalized? Why is this considered a fact, but people's living experiences are considered allegations? How are we supposed to believe that another 90,000 is going to help these folks when no public volunteers are allowed anymore and no public accountability is going to be given? And it was only after volunteers made a fuss about, that, uh, about these issues that any sorts of change was implemented. Also, in regards to the Paul Robinson uh, statue that's being proposed, I feel frankly ashamed to have that up, um, just considering that you guys do not carry his legacy whatsoever. Um, one sec, sorry. Uh, Paul Robinson was an active and open communist. Uh, he claimed that one reverently speaks of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin, the shapers of humanity's richest present and future. He also claimed that you are the non-patriots and you are the un-Americans and you want to be ashamed of yourselves when investigated by the un-Americans uh, uh, committee in the McCarthy era. And yeah, you simply do not follow his legacy, whether it be putting up a statue or, you know, still to this day, every day on the buses at Rutgers, I see houseless folks begging on the street on the corner of Robinson. You guys do not follow his legacy, and it's a shame that you guys are trying to posture like you do. Thank you. Greetings, uh, City Council. My name is Robert Bassett Denport. I live at Ward Street. Um, I just, I just want to uh, talk to you all about the violence in our schools, especially in New Baltic High School. Because um, I, I attend New Baltic High School. I'm a junior currently. And th throughout my high school career, or whatever you want to call it, you know, there's been countless fights, there's been countless um, erotic behavior, such as you know, uh, illegal activity. And you know, I, I just have this concern that, that you know, our school, our, our, and our government isn't doing enough to address the violence and you know taking care of our students. Um, one thing that the school tried to do is you know make this uh, uh, what's it called? talk about mental health, but they don't talk it as much as they ha as they need to. They just put it on a on a, on a statement and say they think that's gonna help the students, but it's not. They need to directly um, work with the students to make sure that not only that we are learning but to make sure that we resolve issues without fighting or violence in general because the, the things I witnessed at New Brunswick High School, you see kids throwing chairs at each other, you see fights every single week, you know, there's blood in the bathroom as well, you, you see kids vaping, I probably have some vape on myself because I was just minding my own business and some kids are just vaping, I'm like, shit, well, well, this is part of me, shoot, what am I supposed to, uh, you know, do? So I just want to ask you, do you have, do you have a plan or at least thought about a plan on you know addressing and making sure that our schools are a bit safe, making sure that my school are safe, you know. What I will tell you is, uh, as you probably will know, I thank you for coming up and expressing your concerns. Uh, uh, one of the things that we don't do, we have a, a board of education, right, that they have meetings, they have a board that you could express, have you gone to those meetings to express your concerns? Mm -hmm. because. They are the ones who need to uh, address it, right, and, and be sure. But nonetheless, we have one of our council members here who is the liaison to the Board of Education, and I'm pretty sure that he will bring back your concerns to that board and make sure that, that they look into your, um, your concerns, okay? Right. But I appreciate you. All right, thank, thank you very much. much. Hi, I'm Daniel Moore. Uh, yes, for first I'm going to start off with uh, saying I don't trust that it's going to be four city employees with cold blue due to where, like I said, you already had city employees volunteering and not reporting 
how nasty it was that was getting over there. But I will say I take your honor and trust due to her since you become president. I, I, I do trust that you will keep an eye on that due to where with that. I will say also since wow I'm seeing progress since you're president now due to where I would thank Miss uh, thank uh, Captain Hayer from the fire department. I don't know if it was an order or if it was volunteer for taking the matters of when I was talking about the same owner of 130 Jones Avenue with over here in Oxford Street due to where they did come and do the investigation where like I said perfect timing where what I'm just walking in to see him over there doing an investigation then next day an investigation with the, with the inspectors now pray that like I said the same thing doesn't happen over there but I thank you due to where you do do a lot of work and like I say the fire department should have got a raise instead of New Brunswick Police Department that's for sure just for the right well, I, no, 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 I just wanted to tell you that I, I had nothing to do with that. That well, was on his own. He did his job because he. But okay, make sure he's pausing the time. Make sure you give her two minutes back. That, 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 thank you. Do, do, do to where, like I said, I thank you. Do to where I know you do do a lot of volunteering on your own, not to be asked or told for safety. And like I said, God bless you on, on that. One thing I will ask you, Mr. Crowderville, please. I'm begging you due to where what? Please start announcing back to the public again of what's going on throughout New Brunswick because I really think these council members and the public really needs to know what's going on. While wow, over six stabbings and slashing over French Street, how many robberies? Wow, still think, let, come on, let's think about that school. And one thing I'm going to speak out of my heart tonight, and please, this is nothing about hate. This is about safety. Please tell me, can a person who is illegal or undocumented, undocumented get arrested or get tickets in New Brunswick? I'm tired of being 46 years. I'm tired of who? And for example, Suzanne Tacor Ludwig telling me, ooh, no, you're not allowed to put your hands on nobody. See, you fell for it. It was just a joke. I said, ooh, if I like a New Brunswick police officer, can I go over and hug him? Ooh, no, you're not allowed to put your hands on no one, Miss Moore. Wow, please. Do you know what it's like to be a victim? I never told the other side with that man, same man, grabbing four women. Did New Brunswick Police Department take, take him in? No, they didn't. Wow, they didn't tell you due to a yeah, I had a panic attack. The Lord led me over to my son's daddy's house due to where I was running around the house. Where is this man? Where is this man? Maybe you ought to be a victim of seeing what it's like. You got the nerve to tell me that what? That I can't, I can't do that, but please tell me is New Brunswick Police Department, what are they doing? If you're an illegal, or a, please tell me, are you allowed to just be arrested, treated equal? Because like I said, you can't say this is a hate due to where I've thrown, thrown GoFundMe pages, 2021 for Townsend Street, when you remember due to where gathering all the people with food and clothes, what I buy my hand warmers, I told them this year I couldn't do it due to where what I had to put up $5,400 with this apartment due to where I got it by myself, but I couldn't help them this year. This is not about hate. Like I said, I work together, but please, I'm not gonna stand here and then by time, wow, if I go through that, please tell me with these drunk men standing over there still continue grabbing people, what is a child gonna go through? If I, I'm not scared to walk through there, because honestly, like I said, oh, I'm very dangerous as long as the other man, I tell you, every man that put their hands on me is dead. And believe me, did I do it? No, and I marked John Tupinski, the fourth man where justice wasn't served with him putting his hands on me. He's the fourth man dead. But did I do it? No, I didn't. But like I said, my point is for them kids, please. What if justice, please? And like I said, 46 years as a black resident, please. What is it illegal to do? What, putting your hands on your, what, as long as you're black? Ooh, driving with no license? Ooh, illegal? What, as long as you're black, black? Like I said, I already know New Brunswick is a racist police department regardless, but like I said, my point I'm getting to, please, let justice be, because like I said, what I'm seeing, you will all regret, like I said, when the first child we go go do something over there. And please, I hope New Brunswick Police Department stop doing this. I've been seeing too many articles due to where wow. What? Due to where they're unlegal, uh, un undocumented or illegal, how what? Yeah, they get arrested and get released. 
Please, come on. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not no person to judge about color. Like I said, no matter what race, creative color, we need each other. And you know I work with all people, donating food, doing everything. But please, I'm not going to have someone, wow, you tell me that I can't do something. And what, the police are sitting right there? What, people urinating in public on French Street? What, New Brunswick Police Department sitting right there? What, the, the, I, I'm getting plenty of videos coming in from other people of what's going on while with New Brunswick Police Department, ooh, you gave me a ticket for being in park after hours and I was only calling an ambulance with someone. But wow, you don't give the other one's ticket? Justice equal, please. That's all I'm asking for. So please, you don't have to answer my question today, but please, as of now, I would like to know if that why New Brunswick Police Department is not, what, doing tickets, checking for driver's license or whatever, speeding, what, because they don't want to deal with the paperwork, or what, if somebody is, what, undocumented or illegal? Wow, I've been seeing too many stories. And like I said, due to where, what? Back then, due to where, what, we had, I, I don't know if the Fed was here, and believe me, I got the story, what, they was here to pick up 150 of them, Mayor Cahill gave an order to New Brunswick Police Department, do not, do not respond. Thank Please, you. justice equal, that's all I'm talking about. Thank you. Unless, like I said, pray you don't become a victim, Suzanne, to call that way. Um, Brittany Livingston Avenue. Um, I'm a driver at the Department of Public Waste, so it's kind of hard to squeeze everything for five minutes that goes on, but I'll just keep it short and sweet. The contract that we, um, that these guys are always bringing up, um, the city council members, the bargaining agreement is still not finished. Um, they don't have any updates, they don't tell us what's going on, um, but they still want us to work without a contract. Um, there's nothing but excuses from what I'm hearing from the board, and it's pretty sad. Um, you know, I want to say thank you to all of my supervisors that deserve the money that you pay Tom Valenti and his salary. You need to be paying them because he doesn't know anything about our department. That's Victor Fair. That is Keith Lewis. That is Mr. Felix. I apologize. I don't know his last name. That is um, Joey Morales. That is Quentin Page. They deserve a raise as well, not just us. Because, you know, you, we work for people that won't even speak to us when we come into the room. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's really sickening and it's sad. And there's a lot of guys that work for us that can't even afford to live in New Brunswick. And let's talk about how they undercutted the union. Um, they, they don't tell, they tell us they don't have money in the budget, just like they're doing these people with cold blue. You don't know what you're doing with their money. You fired all of the volunteers for no apparent reason after they brought up some sort of issues that they were experiencing. Now they can't volunteer there. They do the same thing down in um, Department of Public Waste. They've hired over 11 seasonal workers or temporary workers. They didn't have enough money to pay us when we were asking for a reasonable raise to be able to afford to live in the city that we work in, but you had enough money to pay over 11 seasonal or temporary workers. Those are scabs. Excuse me. Doesn't make any sense. They don't have money for us. They don't have any money to, for our safety to protect us, to make sure that we have the proper safety and equipment to get the job done. They have more than enough money to pay temporary workers. That's a spit in our face. You allow Mr. Thomas Valenti to send police to each and every person's house as a wellness call. We've had people with COVID at the job and nobody alerted the other workers. So possibly people could have COVID and still come into work, but we didn't get any wellness calls for that. We watched the news. The, not all the police, but most of the police kill black people. You wouldn't understand if you don't have my, the color of my skin. Thank but you. you're sending these people to our house to check on us for not coming to work. Doesn't make any sense. Once again, you hired 11 seasonal workers. Isn't that undercutting the union, the bargaining agreement that you guys keep saying, go talk to your union? You undercutted that so that you'll be able to hire and fire these people whenever you get ready. It doesn't make any sense. Where is the money? You're losing your workers. 
Every day I come to work and they're telling me they're leaving. And I, I'm wondering what's going to happen to the city of New Brunswick and their garbage. When are we going to have an arbitration? If you had a meeting, we wouldn't have to come down here. We don't get to speak to Thomas Valenti and whoever else he gossips about how he feels about me, but I'm not a coward like you. I can say how I feel to your face. You can talk about me, a woman, behind my back. But what I'm telling you is, is you need to make it a reasonable wage. Everything is going up. These guys want to stay here and work for you guys, but how are they going to afford to live? It's just that simple. It's not like we're asking you to draw your blood, but trust me, I don't want any. It's tainted. You're snakes, and you're sitting across the table hiring temporary workers when you could have just paid these guys that have been doing it for years. When I first started here, we were completely understaffed. You didn't care to hire seasonal workers then to help out. You waited until you felt like we were striking or not coming to work to hire temporary workers. You don't train them. They don't know what they're doing. Now the truck is made for two people on the back and three people to ride inside the cab. Now you have four or more people. So what happens when they get hurt? Are you going to pay for them to go to the hospital? Are you going to pay for them to do what? They don't get union dues, pension, and things taken out of their check. You're paying them full amounts of money. The guys that work for you for years, they get all of these things taken out of their check. So they're getting paid less than what you pay your temporary workers. But you don't have any money. The same thing you did with Code Blue. Where's their money going? Let me guess. How many more meetings are we going to have to go to before you answer the question? Is somebody going to have to die in cold blue for you guys to get exposed? Like, I'm not understanding what's going on. They deserve, it. They deserve better, too. Thank you. and out of order, I'm going to ask you nicely to step out, and I don't want to do that. Thank you. Yes. Name my address. My name is Holly, and I'm on First Ave. Um, so last week, you guys said that the report would be on how the money is being spent. But then we came here, and the report was, oh yeah, also you said volunteers could continue volunteering at the last meeting. But then we came here, and the entire report was about how volunteers are not necessary. So I'm just wondering when can we get that report on how the funds are actually being spent? Since I it was want to give you something. I was last week. Last week it was at the last meeting that we had. Yeah. But that's when I find out. We find out it was expressed to us that volunteers were not any longer needed. The prior meeting, I thought they were. So I was saying, as volunteer, you know, we always have been looking for volunteers. So I was not aware that uh, we had hired some staff. So. That's, that's what happened. In terms of the money, the money has been spent on, on uh, right now, supplies, it's part of it, administrative, and just to run you know, the shift that we gotta pay the workers that are working there. So that's how the money's being used for uh, COVID this time. Okay. So I, I cannot give you the specific amount because I don't have the amount, but I tell you that the $90,000, and, and it's, I believe it's a little bit over that, it covers that, that part. Okay, so, excuse me, excuse me. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Yes. Okay, and um, so if the city does not plan to involve itself in the day-to-day -day operations of the shelter, as you said, yet it's a city institution, where should we go to demand better conditions on the day-to-day -day operations? Because the people, when we've been listening to them, uh, want longer hours. They want to be allowed food inside. Some even have diabetes and need to be eating. Uh, they want to be allowed to go in and out. These don't really have to do with uh, even how, like, the money itself. This is just human decency, uh, human conditions. So that's still a strong demand from coming from all of us and from all the people we've spoken to. And. Um, why, what, yeah, what will New Brunswick do, and why are you accepting the bare minimum from a legal standpoint? You do way more than the bare minimum on so many other aspects in the city. So why on this? Is it like, oh, you guys should be okay with it because we did the exact to the minimum letter of any law. It doesn't really make sense at all. So 
that's my comment. I would love any response on that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jones, you would like yeah, to I'll respond to all of them. Okay. Yes. Wow. Respond, respond to every answer. But then once he responds, then nobody gets a chance to respond back to him? I'm Come on. Stay. That's how it is. So, it wasn't like that so, before. Excuse me. Again. Mr. Jones? Hey, will you answer now? Yes, please. All right. So for the, I've been taking notes on every speaker. So for the in and out portion of your question, allowing folks to go in and out, uh, for years, Cold Blue since 2002. Um, the trend has always been when people go out, they either A, don't come back, or B, they come back destructive and they start, we gotta start the whole process over again uh, for getting everybody settled. And this is going back from when Cold Blue was at Elijah's Promise uh, and people were sleeping on the floor. Uh, then we also have a huge issue with drug deals happening outside and being brought back in. Um, and this has been ODs in bathrooms, ODs on the floor. This is at Elijah's Promise dating back all the way to 2002, uh, et cetera. We've also had in the past where uh, folks that go in and out cause a lot of issues. Um, we put the time on at 9 o'clock. Most of the people that want to get out of the cold, they come in by 9 o'clock. We get people that show up to the door. They see how many people are there. They say, oh, was a cot there for me. And they leave, they never come back, or they come back later, then they come back at one o'clock and saying, hey, I never let them in. The food portion, the food is permitted by them, by the actual guests themselves. They can bring sandwiches, they can bring their own bags, they're not allowed to eat in the big room. And they're not allowed to eat in the big room at the cot because you know things happen, they mess up, they're dirty, we gotta clean it up, etc. The food is allowed in the hallway because we do take into consideration people's medical situations. I have people that have suitcases full of meds. So that's not accurate that food is not allowed in the building. Food is not allowed in the big room. We no longer give out food. For years, we've had all these big groups in hospitals and houses of worship dump uh, trays and trays of food on us you know, to give to people all throughout the night. Part of the reason was, we only got limited volunteers and no supplies, so the cleanup was short. So the, the cleanup was short. The other challenge to that was sometimes they brought enough, sometimes they didn't bring enough. The third challenge was high, uh, health issues, so uh, dietary restrictions. Some people were allergic to it, some people, so it was a liability. So that's why we don't allow food from uh, partners or different organizations into the building, but the guests are allowed to bring their own food in. Thank you, Mr. Any other comments from you? Um, I'm happy for you to speak to someone who talks to you. Yeah. So you okay. Yeah, I think, thanks for the response, but yeah, I don't think it answered. It's, it's still the question about the bare minimum. Like, everything you said is like, if we actually cared, we could still turn these things around to make the conditions you made. It's still like, just, do it like cutting things back and back and back to just the bare minimum. We'll and I don't really see why <clears throat> that's like acceptable for anyone here. Like why would we just be doing the minimum letter of the law for this? We do it for, we go above and beyond for other things. So why is it, all the answers are like, we just break it down to the lowest, lowest common code written. It, it really doesn't make sense. And if you're saying the city's not gonna be involved in the day to day operation then, what do we do to make things better when we're here where and the people are making these demands? I say this council, Cold Blue has a staff that take it of the day to day. I say this council, not the city, city council. But thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. No more questions. So come on, Mr. Carabo, and give you a chance before we. I'm following you. Good evening, Council. Charlie Craddaville, New Brunswick, New Brunswick today. I um, want to start out talking about police transparency. I know the Council is aware that you know, the police department has an online crime map on its website. I'll read from an August 2021 Tapped into New Brunswick article. Quote, the police department will also be working with its software company to revise its crime mapping technology. Came up at a meeting, there was a contract. I asked, well, when is it going to be done? This was in 2021. The answer was, we have no idea. 
Well, the crime map has continued to exist in sort of a half-completed uh, fashion, but at least some information was posted on a daily basis. To my knowledge, that stopped on December 19th. There have been no updates to the crime map since December 19th. We're now at January 18th, almost a month later. Um, crime map you know, espouses that it has a seven-day delay. Um, obviously, this is a full month. Through you, Madam Chair, can Deputy Director Miller tell us what the status is of this and why it hasn't been updated? I would, I would ask that question, you know, and I would have an answer ready for the next meeting. Anything with the police related, because sometimes we have those answers, sometimes we don't. So to be fair to you and to everybody else, I will make sure that we have an answer for you at the next council meeting. I just put it, I just wrote it right here. Great. I see Deputy Director Miller is yes, here. Could you ask him, him to, him to share what he knows? I see him too. That's why I'm telling you that I'm fully taking all the notes and, right. and I will make sure that we answer that for you that day. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that you will follow through and follow up on that, but I'm also concerned that it appears the police have a different standard for transparency in these meetings, where when questions are asked about human services, Keith's able to get up and give a response in real time, and I appreciate that. Um, Deputy Director Miller is here. He's paid over $200,000 a year to serve the citizens of New Brunswick. More than code blue. And, and, and the city council is shielding him from... Uh, officer James, if you hear that person in the back again, the same person do a statement, can I see us in two step out, please? Because I'm, I'm already, I already told them three times, and I don't want to do that. Being, yes, but I have the right to take somebody else who is not allowing us to conduct a quarter in the post So I ask you, so I want you here, but we need to abide by our rules also. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take the extra two minutes. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, in, in all seriousness, this is, a, this is a different standard here. Deputy Director's here. I don't see, I mean, this is an issue of transparency and that the map's not being updated for a month. Now you're telling me I can get an answer in two weeks, but he's right here. So. What I will say is that uh, I don't think that's an issue with transparency. I think this is a, a, it's to be fair to you because you need an answer. To be fair on the police department, because <coughs> those answers we don't have. So it has been established in the past that let's take time to make sure that we give the answer that you deserve, right? Okay. So sometimes those answers, they don't have it. So is it better to say, no, I don't know, or uh, I'll check. So that's why I'd rather have it. Uh, let me check on it. And I won't have an answer. If I have it before two weeks, I know how to get you. You do. You, know? you do. I but appreciate it. If I don't that. have it, you know, I, I okay. assure you that in two weeks, you won't have your answer. I will try this to get you the answer that you're looking for, OK? And I will find out what's going on with the crime map to give me an update and with the company. So I just jot it down. Great. And wh while you're at it, can you please ask? Who wrote the statement on the city website that smeared the murder victim, Azim Seabright? You already asked that question, and I think you have the answer. But and who, who was it that wrote it? I don't know that you can answer the answer. Right, because there was not a clear answer given. So now that you're the president, I'm asking you to ask the police department who was responsible for that sick and disgusting statement that was posted to our city's website. I also want to read from the same Tap Into article that I started reading from. Uh, with respect to shootings. Uh, so it says, New Brunswick is planning some changes in its efforts to keep residents safe, as well as students returning this fall, at Rutgers University, the business community. For instance, city officials will notify the public of shootings in public places, such as streets and parks, through its social media platforms. The intent is to let the public have the benefit of that information. This article was so beloved by the city of New Brunswick that you published it in coordination with TAP into, it was co-published on the city of New Brunswick website. Um, I'm going to share with you a document. Yeah. So this is uh, information I got from the police about a shooting in Joyce Kilmer Park, September 12th. And you can see that it's documented, it was investigated, an arrest was made, but the city did not share any information with the public until I made a request via email. I received some information, but the city did not 
to a social media post, as you've done for other prior shootings. Also, I'll raise that uh, on uh, a subsequent date, there was a shooting. Thank you. And yeah, this is the other one I wanted to share with you. 11-6, just two days before the election. Oh. Sorry. Uh, at Henry and Roosevelt, there was a shooting. And you can see that it was not solved, or at least there's no information about anyone arrested as of 11.30. And some, in this case, somebody was shot. In the first case, I told you about somebody, an innocent person had a bullet shatter their window of their home, but no people were hit. But in this one, someone uh, brandished a firearm, firearm went off, uh, victim sustained an injury to his hand. That's a shooting. Somebody was shot with a bullet, and on 11.6, uh, the police investigated it, but nobody thought to share this information with the city residents, as had been promised in that Tap Into article that was shared on the city website. So I'd like to find out why they're not following the promises that they made, and I'll look forward to improvements in transparency across the board this year. Thank you. Anybody else before we close out the meeting? Oh, yes, I got all dressed up. I got to speak. Okay, first I'm just let her speak first, the lady, and then you go. Is that, is that okay? That's fine by me. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Lynn Stork. I live at Gold Park Boulevard. Um, yeah, just to echo the concerns about um, uh, public safety, I feel like if the problem isn't acknowledged, we're not going to be able to do anything about it. And I, I know for myself, I mostly get what I mostly get are the um, Amber Alerts. Or you know, a missing person, a missing child, especially, um, which is good, which is fine. But the odds of me being able to do anything about that in the middle of the night, <laughs> the child is probably not going to knock on my door. But if I knew that a crime had happened in the area, you know, I would double check that I had locked the doors before I went up. You know, you would take normal precautions. Um, you know, I would not assume if somebody, if somebody I know, if they knock on the door, I would just be more careful. That would be helpful to me to know. I wouldn't go out for a walk. I often go out at night for walks in my neighborhood, and I feel fine doing that. But, you know, I'd appreciate a heads up if something had just jumped off in the vicinity. Maybe I might not do that tonight. You know, so um, that would be very helpful. And I think it's part of like, kind of denying a problem and then not dealing with it. Also, as related to the young man who so eloquently spoke about the situation at the high school, I have expressed my concern several times to the Board of Education that they're putting out, you know, on an average of over 100 kids every month out of school. Doesn't say for how many days. I know suspensions can, can vary from one day to, it can be out for two weeks if it's not their first offense. And um, that's not even counting the in-school suspensions. But they gave me a whole list of things that, that must be out of school suspensions, including drug use, alcohol use, um, fighting, violence, you know, weapons, anything serious like that. It's out of school suspension. But my question to them has been, and I really haven't gotten a, a straight answer on this, they claim that they do intervention, but it, the kid isn't there. So what kind of intervention are they doing? The kid is out in the community. Um, so this isn't, this isn't helping the young person, and it's not helping our community. Uh, they really need to, need to look at this and try and intervene while these young people are still reachable and not just say, well, you know, your behavior isn't acceptable, you can't be here, go run around the streets for a few days, and then you can come back. That just makes no sense to me. I think that's a travesty. I think we really need to look at a more comprehensive plan, and um, as well as starting to look at more of the um, community policing options and men using mental health professionals. Um, I had read in the paper that Rutgers was doing a big initiative on this, and so I kind of assumed that, you know, Rutgers being right here, <laughs> there would be some, you know, cooperation there uh, with that, but I haven't heard that there is. I'm not sure we would know if there were. Um, but a couple other things I wanted to touch on real quick. I think it's a crying shame that our DPW workers are still without a contract. As hard as they work and as loyal as they were through the whole pandemic, 
with no bonus. Thank you very much. As other people got, you know, they talk about the front lines being sent to the hospital to pick up hospital waste when the hospital waste people didn't show up at a time when we didn't really even know about this yet. We didn't know, you know, how is it spread? How is it? They were out there. You can't get any more front line than that, you know. That's, I mean, you know, next to treating the actual patients. That's as front line as it gets. And um, I feel like, um, you know, they're not properly appreciated, compensated, respected. And certainly this whole business of bringing in temporary workers. Um, I'm sure we'll need just as many people in the summer as we need in the winter. Why would, why would we be hiring temporary workers only for the winter? Uh, or only for now? That does seem just like a, um, yeah, well, Brittany said it. It's, it's like undercutting, undercutting the union and undercutting our own workforce. It was, and, and, and as far as like being able to live here, yes, they need a living wage, but also from the other end, New Brunswick needs to have some affordable housing this season. You know, it kind of goes from, there's no middle ground. <laughs> and uh, just real quick, the Department of Environmental Protection has decided that it will go ahead with that, um, um, environment, the uh, plant, another power plant in Middlesex County. It would be so effective if you guys would sign on to the, um, the uh, Environmental Commission's uh, recommendation and come out against it. I think that would be really, really a powerful thing to do. Thank you. I apologize. You were going to talk as a private yeah, citizen. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I thought okay. that you were talking as a head. Yes, of course. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Yoshi. Um, and um, I want to acknowledge that this past Monday was Martin Luther King Day. Um, I know nowadays he's much celebrated for his vision that there can be equality. And, but also that there can be justice and uh, something that's kind of been whitewashed out of our popular understanding of Martin Luther King was he was also against the, uh, uh, the war against Vietnam. This was like um, a continuation of uh, trying to uh, help hold on to this like colonial um, uh, uh, possession of France, but then once France left, then the United States just continued there. And for that um, unpopular stance, he was like much hated uh, during his time. So uh, the reason why I bring that up is um, uh, I saw that there was an amendment to a resolution, and the current resolution is 012352, uh, I believe, for is to ease the noise ordinance um, to work on the Rutgers Tech Innovation Hub, which is, to be very honest, an uh, atrocity because this Tech Innovation Hub is a collaboration between Rutgers University and Tel Aviv University. And uh, Tel Aviv University has been well documented to be involved in the research of weapons, uh, which has been used against Palestinians under occupation in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. And by the way, Gaza is still under a uh, inhumane uh, siege, uh, 15 years and, and counting. And also, um, Tel Aviv University is famous, or rather infamous, for its development of the military doctrine known as the Dahi Doctrine, which advocates for the targeting of civilian infrastructures and we saw this again and again happen in the winter of 2008, in 2012, in 2014, and the latest assault was, I believe, in uh, 2021 or, tw yeah, tw 2021. Um, furthermore, um, uh, Tel Aviv University um, currently holds the body of Ahmed Arakat, who was killed at a checkpoint in the West Bank. And uh, just to kind of bring it home here, he is actually the cousin of Rutgers University 
African American professor, uh, uh, African American uh, program professor Nora Erekat, and this body is held in its uh, Tel Aviv University mortuary, along with scores of other Palestinian bodies. Uh, furthermore, um, recently, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and uh, Israeli uh, human rights organization, Beit Salem, all reached the same conclusion that Israel is an apartheid state. Apartheid. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that Martin Luther King is often invoked as saying is an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice anywhere. It is really reprehensible that people are going to like lose their peace of mind. Uh, they're going to be doing work at, at night here, so people are going to you know, be hearing for the greater course of one year. Them doing utility work on a place that is most likely going to be developing uh, instruments of war and I would hope that we learn the lessons um, in our history that we should not be continuing this. Um, and I give back my time. Thank you. Carlos Ramirez, reporter with New Brunswick today. I could express the same concerns other members have, but I was not like a broken record since I've been complaining about the same things since I started coming to these meetings. I just wanted to basically ask regarding a recent citation I received at 322 CDM Street. It states that there is littering around the property. One of the um, citations I received mentioned there was trash around it. And I live right next to Thousand Street, which is the host to all the homeless people. I know public safety and homelessness has been the top issue at this meeting for many times and we've discussed it throughout so many different ways. My main concern tonight is why should I pay for a ticket that I, we're cleaning on a daily basis the front of my home and yet homeless people go by there all the time and an inspection comes by and you know just likes putting a ticket on it and we're left to pay for it. You know, I can't do anything. It's in a commercial area where people are buying chips, throwing soda cans next to schools where people are coming, their bus stops are there. We have engine transit running by there. We have buses stopping by there. I can't keep paying these tickets all along. You know, trash gets blown by the air, people littering. I could provide footage just like I provide footage to the police all the time about, you know, incidents that occur on that street but I can't be providing footage every time I get a ticket of who threw that same little piece of trash that makes the whole collection there. So is there a way for me not to pay these tickets? You know, because it's easy to give tickets out to landlords and, you know, renters themselves, but we can only clean up so much a day by before it gets collected or before the inspector comes around. I don't tell you not to pay the tickets after my conversation, but I will ask the, um, Mr. Julius, can we have somebody from the inspection house to talk to Mr. Ramirez regarding that? The address. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so like I mentioned, you know, Thousand Street is right under there. It, it's like the new encampment, aside from where the school's getting built. You know, I can't do anything to help their situation, and those who are trying to are being limited on how they can do it. I myself, you know, can only do so much to help them, but I can, you know, be cleaning up there 24/7. So it's, you know, puts me in a tough spot where I, if I were to say footage of everybody who dumps trash or the wind blowing it into there, it would be a whole collection. We'll follow up. Thank you. Hi, my name's Owen, and I was came to hear the Code Blue report. You'll probably remember me reporting on conditions in the past. And I was one of the volunteers also kicked out of the shelter for recording and reporting on the conditions. Um, from what I understand from the report, it sounds like I may have been in violation of the volunteering program. Um, however, I did submit uh, notification to the department that I'd be attending on the three nights that I did. It was also warmly received by the staff who appreciated my help cleaning and getting people settled. So I had no idea I was in violation. I also am not a resident of New Brunswick. However, um, it, 
did not make that clear that that would be against any violation to volunteer in New Brunswick. So I, I've asked for clarification on that. Um, in 20, uh, OPRA request shows that in 2018-2019 Code Blue season, the expense of the program was $6,000 and it was only paid to one city employee named Keith Jones. How does the city intend to use the additional up to 80,000 funds uh, to improve the program? Or how has it improved the program over that $6,000? I think that we want to give an explanation because at that time the program was run differently. It was. It was. And so you could just give a little explanation into that. Pardon. Is it okay with you now or do you want right away for us to continue well, that's talking about five minutes? It will take you time, but I could give you a few, you know, a minute after. I so if you. So, so let's finish so he could give you that. that okay, I will keep going and then, okay. Um, the other uh, point I wanted to make is that on January 10, a tap into article was referenced, um, and the city official responsible for Code Blue services claimed that he paid for supplies out of his own pocket and that he cleans the facilities himself. Um, I'm just going to read the post. My Code Blue critics will never tell you that I personally pay for all of the supplies, including toilet paper, garbage bags, towels, soaps, mops, brooms, etc. They will never tell you that I personally pay employees out of my pocket. No write-offs, no reimbursements. They'll never tell you that I've cleaned everything from urine, vomit, blood, miscarriage, discharge, etc. off walls, floors, doors, windows, etc. So my question is, is this true? Can the city verify that this employee paid for these expenses out of his own pocket and did this cleaning himself? Or was, were there, was he reimbursed by the grant in order to do these activities? Do you have any other questions before we give you the answers? I'm just, yep, yeah, that's, those are my questions. Okay, so your time, you know that, that's your okay. time. Thank you so much. I'm Mr. Gillies. Sure. Uh, starting from, from the top. Yes. The, uh, the, the Code Blue program prior to the pandemic uh, was a joint program supported by a lot of community organizations. And uh, you referenced Mr. Jones' participation. Um, you know, the, the city got involved more and more as those as organizations couldn't take on that burden. And Mr. Jones was very involved at that time. As we went to the pandemic, there were lockdown rules. Um, a lot of the organizations that were there to help before were no longer able to help. A lot of them aren't, are no longer in existence post-pandemic. The city has gone from just offering a location and some administrative support to now the lead agency that handles the location, the administration, the staffing, et cetera. So there's been a transition over time in our role. And each year, as Code Blue progressed and there were fewer other members of the community who could help, we took on more of the burden. It wasn't, the, it wasn't New Brunswick's intention prior to the pandemic to be the lead, lead agency. Um, you know, there was, there was some questions earlier. I have an email in front of me regarding are we fulfilling our, our grant obligations? Well, the, the grantor in Middlesex County and Mr. Craddeville's email, he seemed concerned, wrote, when Code Blue was called by the county, New Brunswick has opening warming centers. So I think it's important Mr. Craddeville realized that, you know, the grantor, feels that we're meeting our obligations. As it relates to his personal expenses, um, it's allowed for in the grant. It's a reimbursement grant. When Mr. Jones puts in for his reimbursement, it'll be qualified through a reg regular reimbursement processes um, if he so chooses to do so. And if he chooses not to do so, then he won't be reimbursed. Now, if Mr. Jones, prior to the pandemic, as a person who was a concerned citizen, as a member of the community, was involved in Code Blue, and he was taking money out of his pocket and time away from his family to do these things, that was his prerogative. So I, I hope that that answers the question. Thank you. So we should yes. not expect... Remember, the time is up. Yeah. I'll ask you specifically. We don't know the time is Jones will not be paying for the program out of pocket anymore, is what I understand. This or has, has no reason to. This has to be, uh, the first, like I said, like Mr. Blue just uh, commented, it was also for Mr. Jones if he wanted to do it as a private citizen to do that. Or if he wants to get reimbursed, there is uh, the ability to do this so. so. Hello, council members and Mr. Jones. Um, my name is Mackenzie. I live in Highland Park. Um, 
I am speaking today to talk about justice. I was a pastor for a brief time, and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to encourage us to imagine a bigger change while holding the cold blue warning center that has been changed after the reporting to the positive changes. And since volunteers have been banned, this is difficult to do since there's no public accountability. City governments work on public accountability. When the city isn't working to an adequate extent, we have to go the full distance into questions of justice, in which we have to question everything. You have to trust what you see from the voices in the houseless community here. And our observations of the needs of the houseless community not being met, we must think of additional solutions to create practical and sustainable ways of life for everyone, including those paying out of pocket for the expenses, including those who are at the receiving end of, of that money. This is a basic human right. And housing for those experiencing homelessness is a basic human right. And I think this is what we are coming around to again and again today, is that there's a larger problem at hand. We have to welcome and care for all who are in need, especially those who have the most need, and help meet these needs as meeting a basic human right with all the financial resources the city has. But if those resources are protected by other interests of the city, the needs of the houseless community will continue to be pushed under the rug or into one Code Blue Center. The shameful and inhuman policing at our national borders not to mention basically every city in America where people are neglected and in pursuit of profit is a testament to this fact on a large scale. How can we refuse to see? She's naming articles. Other people are naming injustices. Do we see them ourselves? Do we concur? How can we refuse to see and neglect and abuse our fellow human beings? living their lives out on the street and in temporary shelters. Our society's challenge is to build evidence of our shared ability to work together, to care for our neighbors, with a preference for those who need more resources. This is justice. To work with the city is hard when I've been banned from volunteering for reasons I still don't understand. I followed the protocol, I filled out the Google form, I wasn't aware that I was waiting for a response. And to work with the leaders in power is what I've been told to do my whole life. But who really has the power to make change? We all do. But those in power, you and you, Mr. Jones, you have a responsibility as public servants who listen to the will of the people. The will of many here is to see sustained change in how the houseless community is treated in New Brunswick. The changes I advocate for in regard to the betterment of the Code Blue Warning Center and its continuation are as follows. As was mentioned before, could departure hours at the center be changed to a later hour? Or even be open all day for those who might work at night? Yeah, it might, it might mean restructuring the program or creating a bigger program. Could it provide more safety from cold on cold days and in the summer from heat? Could a washer and dryer be added for people to wash their clothes? As we talked about, could a meal be served? Can't we imagine more ways that needs can be met in a sustainable way? What's happened to our collective imagination? We're scared. The city needs to be transparent with the public about how funding is being used to improve life for those who have less resources, and specifically transparency about this 90K. With that funding, what grants can be given to churches, mosques, synagogues, community centers, senior centers, and many other places to create programs that offer transitional housing? And to clarify, why isn't it happening already? Well. Our society has a sickness. It is unwell because we are not all well. Not all given equal access to resources. Power and material means is held by few and withheld from many. I have just 
a couple more sentences. It feels that most of our powerful leaders don't care for the most vulnerable in our society in ways that lead us forward toward a just society. Why is that? Thank you for your comments. So I'd like to think I have some sort of authority to speak on these issues relative to a lot of the council members here and a lot of the people who, who claim to represent New Brunswick and Rutgers University as well. Um, I'd like to address a comment that someone here has previously made. Uh, I don't mean to come across as passive aggressive. I've just forget, forgotten your name, so I'm sorry, but... I'm the, sorry, to you. Please, thank you. Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> but, um, yeah, as I was going to say, the, the, the comments about, about the tickets... I'm sorry to hear about that, and I completely understand the grievances. Like the the ticket, that is unacceptable. But all of the litter, like blaming that on homeless people and, and the people around New Brunswick. Like these are, are your fellow residents. The the whole point of us being here, we're we're supposed to to be here together as a community. And and the the moment that you forget that, you you allow the people in power to you know to win and to continue getting away with these things. I mean, the whole point of us. Being here is, is to show, you know, that we actually care and that we can, you know, actually make a change. We can make a difference in our community. So it's count, quite counterproductive to, to pin it on, on the houses, to pin it on the, the less fortunate, you know. And, and we're here today because, you know, they can't even advocate for themselves. I think someone else already mentioned this, but you can't even speak without an address. <laughs> uh, I'd also just like to comment, I understand, right, you know, this is a meeting, there are formal rules, I do understand to an extent. What I don't understand as a student, as someone who's learning, as, as someone, you know, who's studying all these things around me, right? If, if you're going to learn, why can't we question anything, really? Why can't I question the fact that, say, for example, you, the council members, are on a higher platform than the rest of us here tonight? Is, is it supposed to be symbolic? Is it supposed to be indicative of your condescending attitude towards all of us at these past meetings? What, what is it supposed to mean? And, you know, this is a public forum, right? This is a dialogue. But what kind of dialogue is this where I have to wait in a line, then I have to come up here, I have to speak, and, and, and for what? And, and you don't even ha aren't even obligated to respond to any of, of what I say. What, what kind of respect is that? And, you know, and, and being brought up in an immigrant household, um, because my, my parents are immigrants, I'm taught, oh, you have to be respectful. You, you have to g give a, a proper appearance, or otherwise you'll be profiled, otherwise you won't be taken seriously. I mean, it's for this fact today, right, that I, I wear glasses, I wear a watch, even though I don't necessarily need to wear these things, just for people to take me seriously. And, 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 and for what? For, for me not to be taken seriously anyway? For other people around me? not to be taken seriously. I mean, if, if other people aren't taken seriously, then, then what's the point in me even trying, right? What's the point in, being, in me being here, really? But my questions aside, and, and if there's anything that I would like the council members to take away from my statement here tonight, just one thing. Why are you investing almost $20 million in the police and only $90,000 in cold blue and other related services to, to supposedly help the houses. What, where are your priorities at? I, I understand that this point has probably been exaggerated many, many times over at, at previous council meetings. But even then, why can't we get an answer? What are you trying to hide? And why can't you actually pay the workers of the city? Why can't you pay the sanitation workers here today who after a long shift are, are still make the time to come here and to make themselves heard, only for the council to stand here on, on, on their high, whatever the expression is, their, their, their high chair or whatever, for, for, forgive me, my, I, I forget what it is in English. Horse. Thank you, high horse, yes. <laughs> Just, why? And, and obviously I'm not going to get an answer, but if, if anyone is, is going to listen to me, it is going to be the people behind me, because the people behind me understand where I'm coming from. You don't, you never have, and you never will. I give up my time. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Jones. All right, Keith Jones. I'll try to answer quick. Uh, Keith Jones, city of New Brunswick, lifelong resident, 41 years, born and raised here, went to school here, went to church here, played sports here. I am New Brunswick. 
Um, so I try to answer the questions as best as I can. So the the matter of so what I I'll start by saying that there's a lot of misinformation being floated around. I've heard several things that are just you know things a little off. Um, for instance, uh, rotating shelter versus cold blue, two totally different worlds. A rotating shelter is 10 to 15 guys taken off a coordinated assessment list that are moved to house of worship after house of worship after house of worship. Each house of worship housed them weekly. Then they moved, transported to another house of worship. These are the same 10 people. This is not a new group of people. This is not somebody from New York <coughs> or Edison. This is the same group of 10 people that are being transported to each church. Uh, so the rules are 100% different. That's why they're allowed in. That's why they're allowed to go out. That's why they're allowed to do smoke breaks. Uh, and a bunch of different things that I, that I won't go into. But I will also add that um, the rotating shelter, this is their first year back in every bit of five years. Uh, so without the rotating shelter being in place, the only thing in emergency uh, was COVID. And the rotating shelter is limited in the sense that it only runs from December to late March. Uh, cold blue is whenever the temperature hits 32 and below. So uh, as we talked about last year, we had record nights uh, while the rotating shelter was not in existence. Uh, churches and houses of worship not uh, having transitional housing. We've been knocking on this door for years. This has been one of my biggest concerns that we don't have our houses of worship uh, stepping up to the plate uh, and being the shepherds of the flock as they say they are. Uh, a young lady stood up here, uh, said she was a member of the cloth. Uh, we talked about House of Howland Park. She works for Seth Capadell. They have a limited cold blue program. There's no pressure being put there. We are one of four cold blue programs in the county. We are the only cold blue program that actually promotes our cold blue publicly. We are the only Code Blue that has no restrictions on who comes to the program. So when we're talking about us doing the bare minimum, we actually do the most as it relates to Code Blue. Uh, Plainsboro doesn't have a Code Blue site. Dunellen doesn't have a Code Blue site. So for all of the uh, focus on the city of New Brunswick, I can give you 22 other municipalities that you can talk to about the work about Code Blue. And I would gladly go with you to help how we can figure it out. Why do we have so many homeless people in New Brunswick? We have so many homeless people in New Brunswick because we have all the resources in New Brunswick. We're the county seat, social services is here, reentry is here, uh, coming home Middlesex County is here, workforce development is here, Rutgers is here, the two major hospitals are here, Dina's dwelling is here, Elijah's Promise is here, we have 29 food pantries and soup kitchens here. That's why the homeless population is here and they get dropped off here every day and we've been seeing it for years this is before I even started so that's why they're here if you, you don't if you're homeless and you don't have a phone you're gonna stay where you, you can get to your case manager you're gonna stay where you can get food you're gonna stay where you can get clothing you're gonna stay where you can get a shower you're gonna stay where you can get donations we put people we got people turned down housing in Sarahville and South River because they can't get back and forth to New Brunswick to eat so they would much rather stay homeless in South River instead of the two-bedroom apartment in Sarahville because they can't eat. There's nothing out there they can't transport, get themselves transported. All right, in terms of food, I answer those questions. People are allowed to bring food. They're just not allowed to eat in a big room, and this is for all the dietary medical uh, concerns. Longer hours. Longer hours, in the past, we have had longer hours. Uh, but that was when the city of New Brunswick was only paying me. Um, and I was the only city employee, that's why I was $6,000. And it was also, Mr. George didn't mention, but it was also at a lower temperature. It was at 20 degrees. So we have far fewer cold blue nights than we do now. We're at 32 degrees, which is, uh, last year, like I said, we, we went from 36 nights in a year. We're now averaging almost 80 nights, 80 plus nights a year. Uh, so when you ask about the transparency of the money, Salaries alone puts us at $110,000 for a hundred, as estimated at 100 nights for Code Blue. So that's my salary, and that's also considering five employees and plus maintenance staff and other 
uh, miscellaneous things. So for full transparency, there's also a portal that we have to upload our funding to through the county. So if you want to see what we're spending the money on, you can go to the county's portal and see that. There was a mention of us getting rid of paid volunteers to hire people. There's never been a paid volunteer, ever, in this in Code Blue programming. Prior to us running Code Blue, Keith Jones was the only one being paid, and the only reason why Keith Jones was being paid because Keith Jones wouldn't take comp time. Because Keith Jones doesn't take a day off. So they said, look, well, you have to be paid to do this work because you're still coming to work after Code Blue. Elijah's Promise, who was our partner, was providing two Code Blue captains, actually four, and they were paying them to run Code Blue. So that was the portion, that's the breakdown, that's why it goes from $6,000, the matter of $32,000 being uh, denied, or that's me, I denied the $32,000 for the year because it wasn't enough money. And I denied 32 to get 90, uh, and that was well documented in some papers. So that was the reason why we're able to do the things we are now, that's why we're able to hire more people now. The matter of volunteers, the matter of volunteers, there is no volunteer has ever been banned. That word is just the wrong word, except Charlie. Charlie's been banned. So, uh, but, but for a different reason, but for a different reason. Charlie's banned because he's media, he knows that. We had this conversation a long time ago. Uh, so, no press is allowed in Cold Blue. So, for privacy reasons. Oh, uh, we have not had a volunteer be banned ever. The two uh, young lady and the young man, they were never asked to leave by me. And they know that. They have a recording of me telling them that they don't have to leave. I just asked them to confirm with me. I just asked, I asked them to. I'll, I'll let you talk. Yes. No, eight times you got to let me speak. Wait a minute. You're not talking as a, are you talking, you know, just a response? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that it's not a public comment that mm -hmm. you're making because the five minutes passed already, so uh, you just made it as, as a director of the city, of, which of you the mentioned it, program. exactly, which you mentioned it when you first started talking, just to clarify that, so finish your statement. Thank you. Yes, so they were only asked to leave after they were discovered recording and taking pictures of the signing sheets. And I will add, the members of the cloth, also lied the way into the building. So therefore, there was an infraction from, from jump. If they would have came through me, they would have been allowed in. And even after knowing all that, I still did not ask them to leave, right? So, so that's that part. In terms of volunteers, we've had very, very, very... Let him talk, let him talk. He's okay. He's okay. We've had very limited, we've had a total of 12 volunteers in the past four years. I repeat, we've had a number of 12 volunteers in the past four years. And that's me sending out a cold blue uh, alert for almost 200 nights. So 12 volunteers and 200 plus nights. And that's not because we banned anybody, that's because nobody would step up and volunteer. So now when we do away with the program, now there's an issue that we are somehow banned volunteers. We then ban volunteers. It's actually safer for people not to be in there in that capacity because Cold Blue has taken on a different feel in terms of the mental illness, in terms of the addiction issues, in terms of the anger. It's a liability issue. We don't want anybody to get hurt. We don't want uh, people to hurt anybody else, and we don't want people to be put in bad positions. That's the simplest way of putting it. It could be turned into whatever it needs to be turned into, but that's the honest, that's the reality of it. So if we had 100 volunteers beating down our door every day, that's different, but we don't have those numbers, and we never had those numbers. I'll end by saying that I am thankful that we got this type of response to Cold Blue and this type of response to the issue of homelessness. Um, I personally, the city of New Brunswick, uh, social service, uh, the mayor's office, we've been doing this work for far than I can remember as a volunteer. And if we look through all of the rhetoric and all of the notes, if you look down deep, the city of New Brunswick has and always will be at the forefront of this. 
Uh, that's why we have the population of homeless we got. I'm not only speaking for me, Keith Jones, who has been named more than more times than needed. I'm a New Brunswick resident. I'm also a city employee operating a city initiative. So this is public record. I'm also speaking for this city initiative that we all in this room represent. So at the end of the day, if you want to have a conversation about Cold Blue, because that's one thing I'll add. I've, I've all this, I have not had one conversation with anybody. 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 So for all of this fire, nobody has reached out to me. I make my cell, my personal cell phone is public on every email. I don't even have a city phone. But yet, I still have not received any sort of communication from anybody. So if you want to have a conversation about this, you want to figure out how we truly work together to end homelessness, not only in New Brunswick, because this is not a New Brunswick issue, this is a global issue and it's only going to get worse. So if we want to throw stones at each other, we can do that all day. But if we want to fix the issue, I am all ears, and I'm willing to sit down with any and everybody to do that. It's public knowledge. I'm here on medical leave. I had a stroke on the Sunday prior to Christmas. My running with the Owens and the other person was a week after my stroke, because I'm down in cold blue still trying to figure out how we serve these people. I'll also add, you do not have one homeless person come up to this mic yet and tell you how bad cold blue was. It's always been people from out of town that have not taken the time out to go to their city council, to their house of worship, or to their elected officials to say, hey, why is in my town even doing what the city of New Brunswick doing. So at the end of the day, I, again, I am, I'm all ears. I love you all, because no matter what you say, I'm still going to do the work, and we're still going to do the work at the end of the day. And I will gladly stay after the meeting to talk to any and everybody about Cold Blue. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, uh, we'll let you go ahead, sir. Right. Um, name and address? Sure. Uh, my name is Felix. I am a resident. You don't have an address, just your name, you are allowed. Sure. So um, you yeah. your address. I can discuss my address. My address is 1017 Dogwood Court at New Brunswick. I am a New Brunswick resident. Um, I think that the discussion may have headed in a uh, specific direction, but one thing that was discussed in the most prior conversation was that this issue extends past New Brunswick, and that is um, true. That the situation here is likely that New Brunswick is probably at the forefront of this. But that has more to do with other cities doing a pretty terrible job rather than New Brunswick doing a, uh, like an amazing job, per se. Um, like, the arguments here about here, I think more than like quibbling about whether Keith Jones has done well or not, um, is more about, it finally returns back to that number of like, we're arguing around 90, 90K going to um, the Code Blue shelters when, like, where is the rest of the budget going? Uh, like we discussed earlier about 20 million going to the police, how effective has the police been go doing? Could some of that money be used for homeless, just directly assisting homeless? That, I, like a lot of the argument here is like, it's somewhat gone in a different direction and it would be preferable to look at that, like that. How, how, how is the city doing it? Like, does the city actually care? Like the, maybe um, Keith Jones cares, maybe he doesn't. Maybe um, they don't care, but there's like different definition or competence or competence or whatever. It doesn't matter as much. And the question is more like, what is the city doing to actually address homelessness? Because as mentioned, this problem will get worse over years and years. Um, 1.1 million was, uh, I think that was what was discussed in the prior meeting about two weeks ago for affordable housing. But we're still talking like 20 million is going to the police. Are the police actually addressing public safety concerns? Are they able to solve these issues? Would it be better to allocate some more of that to um, affordable housing? Like maybe putting some of that money into uh, yeah. directly assisting the homeless make work, or maybe trying to build more housing here because there's more food access, uh, better food access, rather than like Sarago, which might be more of a food desert. Why don't we look into some of these solutions? Um, more important than like, is the is the speech by the members of the club earlier accurate or not in regards to failures by Keith Jones? Is more like, why is the city not considering any other solutions rather than arguing we are technically following the letter of law in Copley? Could the city be doing better with uh, where it's allocating all these funds? That is the most important question here, rather than uh, interpersonal conflicts. Now we're to take a motion. Council so President, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry, real quick, Council President. I think the council would be interested to know that uh, there was a comment regarding uh, wellness checks, and the policy is that managers do wellness checks, the police are not dispatched in wellness checks. Okay. Um, and uh, and I, I still continue to say that the um, MEA contract is being negotiated in good faith by, by both sides. 
Thank, Thank you. you. So motion. Second. Second. Local. Council Member Anderson. Yes. Council Member Castaneda. Yes. Council Member Fleming. Yes. Council Member Gaskin. Yes. Council Member Sikora Ludwig. Yes. Council Vice President Egan. Yes. Council President Escobar. Yes. Thank you. Yeah.